Darling, as a speaker, it's my great pleasure. Max is a research chair in machine learning at the University of Amsterdam and also vice president of technology at Qualcomm. He also has a secondary appointment as a senior fellow at Cypher. Uh, and in terms of academic services, he has probably held all the prominent roles that you can think of. Board member of Europe's Foundation, Associate Editor-in-Chief of PAMI, uh, more recently also founding member of Ellis. And I think we can safely say that with an age index of 70, he is probably one of the most influential AI researchers of our time. So um, today, Max will talk about his research on graph neural networks. Um, if you have questions, please post them online. You will see the bottom um, at the web page from which you're uh, watching the stream. Uh, I'm not sure what Now it's gone. Uh, so um, please, Max, uh, the stage is yours. And maybe everybody else mutes their mic. OK, great. Um, thank you, Lena, for the kind introduction. This is my first uh, Zoom, or actually not Zoom, I guess, uh, sort of uh, uh, sort of talk that I'm going to give. So I hope it's uh, I, 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 you feel engaged and you enjoy it. Um, and things go well. Uh, if you have questions, please, uh, you know, put them in the in the chat, and uh, the chair will uh, will um, sort of ask them at the end of the talk. Um, okay, so uh, so the red thing here is going to be my pointers, the laser pointer, um, and um, I'm going to talk about uh, graph neural nets here uh, today. Um, and I have basically two parts. One is about equivariance, and the other one is about hybrid uh, neural nets. And as usual, the big brains uh, behind these projects is not me, uh, but are my very talented students and colleagues. Um, and uh, so for the equivariant mesh CNNs, um, there's Pim de Haan, Maurice Weiler, and Taco Cohen, um, who have been who I have been collaborating with, and it's been a great pleasure uh, to work with them. And on the uh, neural augmentation uh, for graph neural nets, um, I've been working with uh, Victor Garcia, um, so the first team is in uh, Qualcomm Cuba, and the second team is uh, is a Delta um, lab, which is sponsored by Bosch. Okay, so um, the general topic of my talk today is a uh, geometric deep learning, and so the first question we might want to ask is, what is geometric deep learning? Um, and it's basically developed to deal with data which is non-Euclidean or lives in non-Euclidean domains. And um, there's there's many data that is not of the kind of a sequence or a image or maybe a 3D volume of some kind like MRI imaging, um, but maybe it's like data that lives on a sphere. For instance, the weather data on the Earth, um, like if you want to predict storms or something like that, or it could be data that lives on the graph, like social interaction data or protein-protein interaction data. Right, and um, so deep learning has been incredibly successful, um, and so one of the reasons it's been so incredibly successful is basically because of this concept of convolutions. And one of the questions that we ask in geometric deep learning is, can we generalize this idea of convolutions on these non-Euclidean domains? And we call, and, and that's what's called uh, geometric deep learning. And, and there's been a lot of things developed already in this field uh, that go under the names uh, geometric or graph or group or gauge convolutions. Um, and uh, today, I'll be talking about graph convolutions and, and also a little bit about gauge you know, convolutions and group convolutions. And there's many application areas that are set, uh, both in computer vision and graphics and social networks and chemistry and biology and physics and medicine and so I, I hope a lot of these these things these techniques gets will get will find applications in all of these uh, exciting domains okay so if i needed to describe machine learning in one slide it would be this slide um, and it's in my opinion the fundamental trade-off of machine learning is basically there is two ingredients in a prediction machine. Uh, one is inductive bias, which is our preconceptions about how the world works, and we encode those in models. And then there is the data, right? And, and both of these, a combination of these two through training um, will turn into a model that makes predictions. 
Um, and there's some kind of spectrum here. So we have on the one end of the spectrum, we have models where we cannot collect a lot of data for, and often in the medical domain, this is exactly the case. Uh, you might have only a, a couple of hundred, let's say MRI images for a particular disease that you want to model. Um, and there we need to inject a lot of inductive bias in order to make these models uh, make good predictions. Um, and there uh, we typically think about generative models. Uh, so in generative models, and I will go a little bit deeper in what those mean, uh, we can, in, in, you know, uh, all the variables have meaning, the interactions have meaning, and so there's typically not a lot of parameters. Um, and um, basically these are causal models or models based on physical interactions and stuff like that. Um, and they're pretty good at out of domain generalization. So we can we can train these models in one domain and they typically, you know, if we do it well, can also do quite well, you know, if we slightly change the domain. On the other side of the spectrum, there is um, like a huge amount of data. Like think think about uh, sort of uh, sort of image data or um, sort of trans sort of text data where we want to do sort of uh, automated machine translation. Um, and there, deep learning really shines. Um, and um, you know, the, the the advantage is that we can make really good predictions. Um, but the disadvantage is that we need lots and lots of data to make these models work really well. And also, we need to define these things on a fairly limited domain because the bigger we make the domain, you know, we almost exponentially need more data to cover that domain. And so, typically, these models are not really good at uh, out of domain generalization. So these are the, the trade offs that we have. And so the, the big question is then how, how or, or the, the name of the game is how can we inject the right inductive bias into our models, right? If we, if we put the wrong inductive bias, clearly uh, we have biases that are not going to be very helpful for making predictions. But if we get the right inductive biases and, and just enough of that inductive bias, um, then we can get make really good models. And how can we combine this with deep learning? And there's basically two ways that we've approached this. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about both of these uh, strategies. The first strategy is what we call uh, sort of symmetry. So identify symmetries in the world and try to bake these symmetries into these neural networks. And of course, we already know that convolutions are basically an expression of translational symmetry. So we we understand that you know if we try to detect an object on the left upper corner of an image or the right bottom corner of an image, you know, it's still the same object that we want to detect, and so there is a sense of translational symmetry. And if you work through what that you know mathematically what that would imply for a neural net, if you start from an MLP and you add that particular symmetry, you get to a convolutional neural network. But that's translations. Can we also do rotations and maybe scalings, which is just slightly different. It's not a group. It's a semi-group if you do it on pixels. Um, and, and another example is, for instance, permutation. So if you have a graph, um, then um, if you represent the nodes of the graph as a vector, um, then you know, the ordering of those nodes is, is immaterial. It's a symmetry. And so you really want the outcome to be independent of how you ordered those nodes in this vector, and so you now the symmetry group now becomes a group of permutations. Okay, that's one part of the talk. The other part of the talk is about um, this idea that the world is really simpler in the generative direction. Um, so you know the world, the physical world. You know, there's physical laws. The laws of physics are surprisingly simple, especially at the micro level. Um, and um, you know, of course, causation happens in you know in the generative direction. So if we think hard about how the data is generated um, th through the sensors, for instance, um, then typically these models, uh, they, they're, they're easier. They, they require less parameters to write down. Um, and so, but deep learning sort of works in the opposite direction, as I will explain in more detail later. Um, they work in the opposite direction of the causal direction in some sense. And, but the, and so one natural question is, can we embed, can we add this generative uh, causal information that we have about the world into our neural networks. And so that's the second thing. And one uh, area that we applied it to is MRI sensor, um, MRI image reconstruction from few input 
uh, measurements, and the other one, for instance, is channel uh, decoding, so error correction decoding um, using a noisy channel. So now let's talk about part one, uh, which is a mesh, equivariant mesh uh, CNNs. Um, and let's first review um, again what a convolution really is. So if you have like a neural net here at the bottom, um, it's a bit small, but it doesn't matter. There's a couple of operations in between these layers, and these are, you know, typically of the kind the convolutions plus nonlinearities. And here I sort of animated, or, or, or this, Vincent has here animated uh, what a convolution looks like. It's a linear operation. It's some you have a little filter, which is this three by three template here, which you slide over the image, and then you take the inner product between basically the values of the filter and the underlying image, and you add them up, and then you store the result in the sort of the array uh, one level above. And then you do a nonlinearity, and then you repeat this process, possibly also with some downsampling or pooling operation, before in the end you put everything into a big, a big vector, and then you add a sort of an MLP neural net, and then you make predictions. Okay, so that's a convolution. A slightly different way of looking at a convolution that's useful for us is as a message passing algorithm. So now um, we don't typically have one of these things, but we have a stack. So here at the bottom, you see the stack of uh, feature maps. So if you take one pixel and you slide, you know, you, you slice through, you know, all this this stack here for this particular pixel, you know, this this is the pixel. So you get a a, a stack of sort of uh, values here for each, one for each of these feature maps. Um, so this little vector living on each one of these nodes. And what we do with the convolution, at every point in the image, we sort of, every node collects information from its direct neighbors. It, it sort of queries the values of the neighbors, and it then multiplies that vector that's living here with the matrix W1. Um, it does that for all the neighbors and itself, and then it adds all the results together to get the value at H0. And the important thing to note here is that these matrices here can all be different because you know, north, east, and north, south, and west, they're all different, and they will also be always be different um, for these uh, sort of for images. Now, if you go to graphs, that situation is actually a little different. So here you see again what a, what a normal convolution looks like. Um, and um, But for a graph, you know, it's, it's much more irregular, right? So first of all, the number of neighbors could be different. So where here you have always the same, you know, uh, eight neighbors, um, here, uh, you know, for this node, the number of neighbors could be very different than for this node. And so now, and moreover, um, I could I could sort of, if I have ordered them like one, two, three, four, five, in that order, like I've done here, one, two, three, four, five, et cetera, right? In a graph, if I just move these two around, so keeping the edge between them, I sort of move this guy here. Now the order is different, but it's still exactly the same graph. Um, and so we really can sort of have different you know, messages for each one of the neighbors because the neighbors change all the time and their number changes. And so basically the solution has been to just send the same message from each one of these neighbors. You, you sort of get out of this problem easily by sort of sending the same message by all of the neighbors. And only, you know, the guy in the center can send a different message uh, to itself. So that's actually what a graph neural net is. It's very simple and it looks a lot like a normal convolution if you view it this way. So if you, if you think of it, a graph convolution like k star f at a point p, then there's a self uh, sort of ma matrix here which multiplies the feature at the point itself where we're going to collect the information with the matrix k self. And there is this sum over all your neighbors where we have the same matrix k neighbor multiplied by the feature vectors at the neighbor neighbors k. But it's important that this k always has to be the same k. It has to be shared. And this has, in fact, you know, um, led to a lot of discussion in the community. Is this actually a powerful enough sort of architecture? And it turns out, you know, some people were skeptical in the beginning and later it turned out that it is actually a pretty powerful thing anyway. And this is not the most general thing you can write down, but um, it, it is pretty powerful. But it's for graphs, basically, it's, it's the right thing to do. But now we wanted to ask the question, um, what if what you're interested in is not a graph, but it's more like a mesh? And of course, there's a difference because a mesh is sort of a discretization of a manifold. Uh, 
And so, uh, so here you have a meshing of like a dolphin, right? Um, and um, why I'm talking about that here as well is that um, for in the medical domain, you, you often see when you do sort of uh, computational models, you often see that people do mesh uh, sort of, uh, for instance, a heart, a beating heart, or in this case, in this paper, um, it was arteries that were being modeled by adding a mesh on them. And then uh, you can sort of, you know, try to predict uh, certain uh, sort of properties of arteries like this uh, by by doing a graph convolution on this graph. It looks certainly looks like a graph, right? There's nodes and there's edges, and so you can just apply like a graph convolution neural network for, in this case, coronary artery segmentation. And then uh, here's another example um, from from these guys here. Uh, for 3D shape analysis, again, it's a meshed object, and, and they used uh, a graph convolution. But the main point that I'm going to make here is that, in fact, um, it's a bit limited to do that. It's not wrong, but it's a bit limited in the sense that this completely ignores the underlying geometry of the problem. In other words, it ignores the fact that a mesh and a graph are really two different things. And so to give you an example, um, if you would do a graph convolution in this part here, so we have a point P in the middle, and we're sending these messages from the neighbors to the middle, um, then this situation for a graph would look exactly the same than this situation, because it's still the same ordering, and it's the uh, sort of the, you know, the same messages that are being sent. Um, but the geometry tells us that there is an angle here, which is bigger than this angle here. So the geometry is actually different but the graph seen in would not see it. And so the question is, is, is this actually the right way, the proper way of doing it? Now, the, you could think, well, we should really, you know, just take what we ordinarily do for convolutions on a plane, like here, and just try to discretize that, you know, on, on, the, on the manifold, on this, on this object. Um, and then try to just think of it as a discretization of a normal uh, sort of convolution. And um, then you run into issues fairly quickly. And uh, let me try to tell you why there is issues when trying to do convolutions on manifolds. Um, so if you do a convolution on a plane, then you start, let's say, with some kind of filter, like here, right? And then you want to share that filter with another position in the plane. So this is this uh, sort of the translational sort of property that you want to take some filter and you want to move it to some other place and then share it. And it, it, in a normal convolution, it doesn't depend on the path that you take. You basically, whichever path you take, if you translate this thing to here, you get the same answer. But the problem is that if you do it on a, on a sphere, right, then uh, in fact, this is not the case. So in a sphere, um, if you take your um, sort of uh, filter here, and you want to move it here, so you see that you know you have to sort of parallelly transport it to this particular position. Um, and uh, but if you take it along this path here, from here to here, then in fact, if you now compare the two, then you see that the orientation is completely different, right? From here to here, the orientation is actually very different. Um, and so you're sort of into trouble uh, because now you cannot really meaningfully sort of in a unique way share this fil filter with any other point on the manifold. And uh, maybe even more dramatically on a Mobius strip, um, you get something similar where you, you, you know, if you parallelly transport, you know, this filter, you go around this thing, then in fact, it becomes back mirrored um, when you're around, right? And so there's no unique way even to, to define the handedness um, of this particular frame. Okay, so that's something that we really have to resolve. And the way we're going to resolve it is to say, well, there is a particular symmetry in this in this problem there is we can we can not in any way sort of distinguish in this case the orientation of the frame we have to just consider that the symmetry of the problem uh, we have to basically uh, make sure that whatever we do we know how to transform from one frame to the other frame if we rotate it um, and here it would be the handedness okay so that brings us to the concept of equivariance um, and in equivariance, we basically say that um, if I have some function that goes from x to y, so this could be um, our convolution, um, and I have some um, transformations that act on x, this could be a rotation or a translation, uh, both in x and y space, 
um, then we can say that f is equivariant if uh, this particular diagram commutes. This, if I first do my convolution and then I do my rotation, it should be the same as if I do first my rotation and then my convolution. And in translations, um, in terms of an image, you can very clearly see that that's true for a convolution neural net. So if I take an input image and I convolve it, sort of it's kind of, kind of a filtered image. If I translate it, you know, this uh, particular gecko uh, moves here. And if I then filter it, I get this. And this will be the same thing as I take the filtered gecko and I translate it. It turns out that this particular equation, this equivariance equation, is enough to sort of, you know, in a, in a, in a con consistent way define um, uh, sort of the, the convolutions under these kinds of symmetry operations. And to give you a little bit more sort of intuition of what equivariance means. Um, so let's have a, in this case, a special group. So the group would be uh, the group of four rotations over angles of 90 degrees. And uh, so here I have an input image, and here I rotate my input image. And here I have my sort of convolutional operator. So my convolutional operator in this case does two things. Um, it has uh, it is an eye detector, um, and it it detects the eye under four different orientations. So it's, it takes this filter, but it rotates the filter under four, uh, again, these 90 degrees rotations. And there's a mouse detector, which also, we, you know, we rotate it under uh, four times 90 degrees. And then what you see is if you, let's say, okay, you have this input image and there is an eye and, and clearly there is a mouse. And so our filters detect, you know, they fire at these positions and this position. Okay, now what happens if I rotate my image then what happens is that first of all, you know, of course, the eyes and the, and the mouth are rotated, um, and so what will happen is that not the first one will fire because this eye was up, you know, at, at the wrong orientation for this particular image. So now this particular stack of uh, sort of features will fire, um, and that means that uh, not only so two things have happened. First of all, the uh, sort of the you know we 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 did a rotation in the feature map. And secondly, we moved from this stack of feature maps to the next stack of feature maps. But anyway, it is a predictable transformation. And we can show that if we first, if we first do a um, convolution and then a rotation, it's the same as first doing the rotation and then the convolution. And so that is an equivariant operation. Um, and uh, sort of maybe more abstractly, you can, you can view it this way. So I have a particular point x, which could be an image. There's one point here is an image. And I can rotate the image, and so that's the orbit. Here's the orbit of rotating that image. And at every point, you know, I have a particular, you know, let's say for that image, I have a particular feature vector, which is, uh, you know, this shown as this particular sort of uh, line here. Um, now, if I rotate around, right, I, I basically uh, this guy, this vector here moves to this position. Right, and it the vector itself also rotates because it's pointing inward, and here it's pointing inward too. So this basically means that the vector um, R x at the rotated point x at the at you know for the stack you know, this is one two three four. So you can also think of one two three four circles at this particular value here um, at a plus r is a rotation of the vector at x a, um, and that's you know what we call equivariance. Okay, so how does that now look for a mesh? Because this is sort of uh, more sort of this, this is what we call the group convolutions. And now, how do we do this for our meshes? So um, here I have a little uh, sort of a meshed up uh, sort of bowl, and um, so at the middle I have point P, and I want to collect my uh, sort of information at this point P by doing a convolution. So the first thing is that I will have to define a gauge. I have to define, you know, where is the angle theta equals zero in order to do my convolution. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to move uh, these points here actually to, you know, what we, what we call the tangent plane. So we move them to the tangent plane of this particular point. So that's depicted here. And we have to then pick a angle that we assign zero. In this case, uh, that's the green point. So we just pick one of these points arbitrarily and we say that's angle zero. And then the situation looked like this. So now we do our convolution. And it turns out in this particular case, it's a graph convolution. And so it's, a, it's isotropic. And so we get some, you know, we get some answer here in the middle. 
Now, I could have also picked another gauge. I could have said, well, instead of the green point, I'm going to make the red point theta equals zero. And as I said before, there is no meaningful way, you know, no unique way of doing this. So the answer then is let's do it for every possible way and then to at least figure out how these things, you know, map to each other, how they transform to each other. So the other option I could have cho chosen was, okay, take the red dot to be the sort of the angle theta equals zero, do our convolution there. So this basically means now this, this, we're sending these messages here and we get some information in the middle, okay? And now these two things have to be related to each other. So we have to give, the, in this case, the same answer because it was a graph convolution. And, in, and indeed graph convolutions, because the, you know, because it's isotropic, they, they send the same message from each one of the neighbors. That's exactly what will happen. Now, for, for a more general setup, which is our mesh convolution, in this case, um, we have a little vector living, you know, it's not just a single point, but we have a little vector living, you know, on these, uh, on, on these points, we have a vector signal. And so again, we have the same situation that we could pick, you know, either the green or the red point as our theta equals zero. But now, um, if we're gonna do our convolution, you know, the end result could be like a little vector sticking out in this direction if we do it in this gauge. But the problem is that, you know, this is a rotated frame, you know, if you compare it to this one. So here, the vector would actually be pointing in a different direction. And so now we get a result which is sort of depending, depends on the gauge that we chose and we already decided that's arbitrary. So what we need to do, we need to show us how do, how do these two things relate? So if I know this and I know this and I know how these two would transform, then I'll be good too. So equivariance would be saying, you know, if I would do, you know, my convolution here in this particular gauge and then I transform, it would be the same as doing my convolution here or, you know, transform, first transform and then do my convolution here. And again, we have a commuting diagram. Okay, so um, maybe in terms of equations, let's first review again the equation for a graph convolution. So I have a particular feature vector F living at the center node P, and I have some matrix which multiplies it. Um, and I add to that sort of a single matrix K multiplied by the feature vectors of the neighbors and they add them all up and then I get my convolution. That's what the graph convolution was. And it is isotropic because this thing is the same message sent from all neighbors. So it's sort of this, this case on this side here. Um, now we're gonna generalize that to this equation. And the only difference is, it turns out, is that we can, there's two differences. This difference here is that this matrix, these messages that were being sent can now actually depend on theta. It can depend on the angle from which the message was sent. Um, and that's important because now the, um, the convolution is no longer isotropic, which means it's more powerful. You can, you can, you know, it's, it's more flexible sort of filter that you can use. Um, and the other thing we have to do is this row matrix. Now explain and now what that row matrix is. Um, but that basically tells us um, that we it has something to do with parallel transport. Okay, so in this case here again, um, we have our sort of our, our basically example on a flat manifold. So let's let's look at the flat situation. I have some vector here, um, and I have some gauge defined by you know uh, basically putting the the orange line here to the theta equals zero uh, 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 map, um, and then I'm going to transport this particular vector in the plane here. So it's just, it's parallel. So that's that's just parallel transport. But here I might have chosen a different gauge, right? So here I chose this as the sort of the theta equals zero line. But let's say at P we might have chosen a very different gauge, which might be this one. And again, this is arbitrary. So then even though this in this space things look nice and parallel, in this in the space of these coordinates, actually this vector has rotated. Right? So this vector that was like this here, like this here is now rotated like this, rotated like this, and that's just because we chose a different frame. Okay, so we need to compensate for that, and that's this row, part of what this row does is exactly compensate for that. And there's one other phenomenon, which is that if we if we parallel transport on a, you know, on, on a manifold, you know, then, um, it, it's not, it's not, you know, par parallelism is, is a bit tricky. So in this particular case of a meshed up uh, uh, sort of manifold, in you know you have to you have to look at the at the tangent plane and the tangent plane you know you have to define it in a particular way. But let's just think of it some kind of plane which is sort of you know uh, 
you know, on the on the tip of this of this point. It's equilibrating at the at the tip of this point. And um, so here it's this this particular circle here, the solid circle. That's the tangent plane defined there, right? But in order to move it, I first have to rotate this plane in this direction to make it in the same orientation here, and then move it, right? So there's these two operations: I, I rotate and then I move. And this is basically on a on a on a manifold. You know, the, the parallel transport you know, is is a bit more tricky than than just you know in a plane in, in a planar uh, situation. But it's well defined, and so again, so I have this parallel transport by rotating this, and and then also moving to the new frame, and all of that is absorbed in this row matrix. So I take my feature at the neighbors, I then transform on the row, which is these two operations, and then I take the inner product with my with my uh, sort of uh, filter, uh, which now depends on the on the theta. Okay. Um, yeah, I just wanted to leave it at that. We've done uh, interesting experiments to show that this is actually more general than um, than uh, a normal graph CNN, um, and because we can make these filters now uh, anisotropic, and it's not all that complicated as you see here. It's not like a very complicated algorithm, um, but it has this beautiful equivariance property. Okay, so then the second uh, topic I want to talk about is uh, another way to inject. Uh, um, inductive bias into our models, uh, which is what I call neural augmentation. Um, and the first thing is to um, sort of think a little bit about the difference between uh, gen generative forward models and, and inverse models uh, or, or deep learning models. Um, and basically, a generative model is a model that imagines how the data gets generated. So it sort of models the data generation process, like here's two you know, two uh, galaxies which are colliding under gravitational forces, right? And we know all the laws of physics, and so we can basically simulate it. So a simulator is one, you know, uh, kind of, of generative model. Uh, now, graphical models are more popular, or have been more popular in the machine learning community um, as ways to define generative processes, right? So here's a graphical model that tries to depict, you know, how, like, let's say, uh, documents are being generated or something. Um, and then there's probabilistic programs, which is basically an extension of graphical models where you try to encode that into some kind of co you know, some kind of programming language where you can very nicely sort of specify which distributions uh, you want to use, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then you can simulate and, and also do automatic inference in these models. And then finally, uh, you know, differential equations are also a kind of generative model where we put a lot of prior knowledge in of how the laws of physics uh, really operate. Now, machine learning um, is kind of interesting. Is doing exactly the inverse. In machine learning, um, instead of going into the generative direction, we go into the opposite um, sort of predictive direction or discriminative direction, which is we feed in sort of the raw signal that we find in the world. Uh, in this case, uh, you know, pixels of an image, and we predict sort of the abstract properties of this input. So in this case, the properties are, let's say, the you know which digit uh, did we see. But it could also be other things like uh, with the style with which the digit was written, for instance. Right? And it is in the opposite direction as the generative direction. And these two clearly are related right, through Bayes' rule. So in the generative model, we think about given a class and other properties, you know, what is the, what's the probability of the data? And in the discriminative model, we say, OK, given the data, you know what is the class of the of the you know, of the image that I see or the data that I see, and these are related by Bayes' rule, which is uh, which we all uh, know and love. And there's a uh, you know different advantages and disadvantages of these uh, different methods. Um, I would say you know you have white box kind of generative models. They're very data efficient, so they're on the left hand side of that spectrum that I showed before. Uh, they use a lot of expert knowledge and a lot of inductive bias, let's say the laws of physics and causality. They're highly interpretable because every variable actually means something uh, in this in this world. Um, and they have good generalization, for instance, because they use the causal structure um, and, and the physical structure of the world, and so they can do much better out of domain generalization. Now, the black box, they are far more flexible. And um, so we have to acknowledge that um, our, in many cases, our imagination is limited and we cannot write down the infinite complexities of how the real world works. So think of a social network and how people interact. It's just way too complicated to write down. Um, and so 
it's much better to write down a model with a huge number of parameters and let the data determine you know, what the real patterns are in the data. And these neural networks, they basically do that. And they, so they, they allow you to put a little inductive bias, but let the data determine all these things. Um, they're very fast in making predictions and you, because basically you don't need Bayes rule in order to make predictions. You can, you, 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 the models are trained in the direction um, that you're actually making use of them. And they're also highly accurate. And basically at this point, they're the best models for many tasks. Um, so um, it, all of this is connected to what we call inverse modeling. When we do inverse modeling, uh, we start with an image, uh, let's say, or some, some, something we observe in the world. And then we have an encoder model, which basically tells us um, you know, how this thing looks like at the measurement level. So this is the ground truth world. And then the measurement basically looks like you know, some kind of a corruption process. And then there's the inverse model, which then says, okay, take, take the measurements and predict back for me what the, you know, what the, uh, you know, what the original uh, data looked like. Um, and there's many exciting examples like this in the field of inverse modeling. So here's an example that we've worked on a little bit, which is uh, radio astronomy. Um, so you have some latent uh, model of the sky uh, where there are certain sources that emit radio waves. Um, this is not what you measure. What you measure is uh, in the Fourier spectrum. And in fact, you're not even measuring in the Fourier spectrum. You're measuring a very sparse subset of the Fourier components in the Fourier spectrum because you have these antennas and these, there's only a finite set of those. Um, and then, of course, you could naively think, yeah, let's just do an inverse Fourier transform. As, you know, this was a this was a forward Fourier transform, and you find that that's a very poor reconstruction. And so, what you really want to do is either go from here to here to do a good reconstruction of this. And of course, that's where you want to use some kind of deep learning. Um, very, very similar is MRI. So, in MRI, again, I have some latent structure of a brain, and then uh, there is we model or we measure. So, we, we measure in the Fourier domain. So, the sensors are basically uh, measuring in the Fourier domain. We really measure a, a very small subset of those Fourier components. And then the task is how do we reconstruct you know, this image? If you do a naive thing, you'll get a very poor reconstruction. And then finally, um, there's error correction decoding. Um, so I have some kind of uh, message that I want to send, like a bits, a bunch of bits, in this case, organized as an image. And I'm going to add some uh, redundant um, error correction bits to it. I'm sending all that over a noisy channel. Uh, so that's our sort of a decoder. It will give me this thing. And now the inverse model is to uh, clean it up. So to uh, go from here to map from here to here. Uh, it's a complicated, but we can do it. And we can basically uh, get the clean uh, image back. So what are the traditional solutions to these types of problems? Uh, typically, you write down your measurement model, which is p y given x, which is your sensor model. You have some prior over the input domain. This could be the images of the sky or the MRI images. And then you do basically gradient um, ascent on this uh, sort of objective to find the most likely image X, which, could explain, which can explain the data Y. That's basically this very simple iterative algorithm. Uh, more sophisticated algorithms are something like uh, belief propagation, where you will, again, send messages, you, you, you represent your problem as a graph, and you send messages on this graph. Um, and the, this is what's called uh, belief propagation. Anyway, all of these are iterative optimization schemes. Now, the deep learning solution is, again, the flip side of, flip side of this, which is um, I'm going to not try to model anything explicitly. Um, I'm just going to collect a huge data set um, of points x and y, where x is the sort of input, the noisy input, and y is the reconstruction. Um, sorry, the opposite, in the other direction, y are the observations, and x is the sort of the, the clean input. And then I'm going to train some neural net that takes the noisy input and predicts a clean image x out of that. Um, and so the uh, one very sort of, uh, sort of well-known algorithm that does that is the UNet. Um, there's all sorts of convolutions running inside this thing, and there's downsampling and all this kind of stuff, um, and skip connections. And then in the end, you'll you'll find some kind of segmentation or reconstruction of the original image um, that you've done. So importantly, um, this is just a learning-based approach, and you need a huge amount of data to make this train well, and it doesn't use uh, 
important information about the generative process, which goes uh, directly from uh, from X to Y, which is which is the measurement process. Okay, and so the the hybrid solution that we've worked on, or the question that we wanted to answer is, okay, how are we going to um, embed this generative process into the guts of a neural network? Um, and so there's a couple of things that we base that on. We basically say, well, each one of these um, sort of classical algorithms, like this one, um, they are iterative optimization schemes. So let's use that iterative optimization scheme as the core, the backbone of a neural net or an RNN, a recurrent neural net. And then train a neural network around that backbone to correct for the mistakes that the backbone uh, sort of solution is making. So now we're not trying to, like here, uh, try to predict the entire signal, which could be highly nonlinear and difficult. We're just trying to predict the the mistakes that the that the original um, sort of inference network is making, the engineer's sort of solution, the classical solution is making. And since we're in an RNN, we can also add a whole bunch of memory states, S, to store information, because now we have an RNN uh, sort of set up. Um, now, the classical solution that we want to build around um, is a is a is a message passing scheme that works um, on graphs, and of course we like it because we already know that a graph neural net also sends messages on a graph, and so they're easy easy to compute. So here's what we call a factor graph for low density parity check codes. Um, you have some nodes which are variables, and you have some factors which which basically relate the bits which are on these nodes together. They basically say they have to sum up to to one, for instance, or to zero. Um, so that um, so, so that they, they form a constraint on these bits, and then in order to decode, um, you have to send these messages over this graph uh, using belief propagation, and then you'll find the most likely explanation of you know for this particular bit on this node, given all the evidence that you're seeing and given all the constraints that you have put in your model, and that's basically what a, a low density parity check error correction decoder is based on. So uh, to remind you again, uh, our graph neural net also sends messages. So I already treated this graph. So it's just normal convolutions and graph convolutions are just sending messages on a graph. So that's very similar to the other message passing scheme. Um, and you know, here I've written out the equations. Uh, if you don't like equations, you can skip it. Uh, but basically, you have hi and hj, which are the two uh, vector feature representations at two nodes. There's some some feature which lives at the edge. Uh, you, compute, you push it through some neural network to get some message on a particular uh, edge, this, in this case from this going from this node to this node. Um, and then you collect all of these messages together to get your new uh, sort of message here. And then you push that through a nonlinearity to get your new feature vector here. So you see it is very similar to what actually normal message passing is doing. Um, so. We had to generalize that for the LDPC error correction decoding um, application, we had to generalize message passing on a normal neural net to message passing on a factor graph. It turns out it's not very difficult. You just treat you know, these, uh, these factor as other nodes in your graph neural net, and then you have two types of nodes, and you can just do whatever you did for a GNN, but then for these two types of nodes. It's a very straightforward generalization. OK, so then. The whole thing looks as follows. The details are probably a little hard to understand here, but just focus on the sort of the big picture. We have these blocks, which are iterations of the algorithm. So think of these as the iterations of the of the other uh, sort of decoding algorithm or the, the you know the the other inference algorithms. It's an iteration of BP. So we get some messages in. We do an iteration of BP. BP sends its its messages to a GNN, a neural network. So they receive these messages, then they compute some output. The output gets com combined with the belief propagation message, and a new message mu is computed. This is now a corrected message. So the G GNN is now correcting the belief propagation messages. The vector graph also has its own internal state, which it also pushes to the next one. So because this is sort of the, uh, the GRU or you know unit or you know the, the, the RNN unit, so it has its own dynamics, and this repeats over over iterations. And then at the end, we compute our final estimate of what we want to compute, let's say the bits of our error correction decoding algorithm. <coughs> and then uh, we have ground truth for a whole bunch of examples, and we compute gradients. And then um, we do back propagation on this loss. 
So with the whole chain <laughs> to compute um, our best estimate of, um, of our neural net. Sorry, I need to drink something. Um, OK, so we train this as an RNN and iteratively, and then we're going to test it. So here's a couple of examples where we can test it. So again, um, so, so what we have done basically is incorporate the generative model, which, is, which determines the belief propagation into the guts of a neural network, which is the RNN. Um, and so here we have a fairly challenging kind of dynamical system, which is a Lorentz tractor, which is chaotic. Um, so this is ground truth if you run it. Um, if you do nothing and just look at the observations, it's this. If you run the GNN, if you just train the GNN alone, you get this. If you do an extended Kalman filter, which is a, a sort of an improvement over normal Kalman filter, you get this. And if you do both of them combined, the algorithm that we propose, you get this. And in, in terms of error, um, so here is the number of samples that you give to the problem. Of course, if you give it a few samples, it's a much harder problem, and certainly the the neural networks, uh, they fail because you don't have enough data to train. Um, and the Kalman filters, which are here, they're doing fine because they don't need any you know, parameters to train. So they're always sort of constant. Um, but then as you add samples, you know, this GNN is going to do better and better because it can sort of, it can, it can, it can model the mistakes. It can mo model much better than the extended Kalman filter because there's, there's mistakes in that model. But then if you do both, Together, then you can see that these curves are actually better than the both of them. Um, and here's the um, LDPC error correction decoding algorithm as a function of how much bursty noise we add to the channel. So this is a normal Gaussian channel, but we're going to add with a certain probability some high variance noise, which is actually uh, quite realistic. Um, and then uh, we're going to do decoding as we increase this sort of variance of this noise. And we do 5% of the time we add this noise. And then you say that you can see again that um, the, uh, so the, the typical classical algorithms, LDPC decoding, they do fine if this sigma isn't all that large. But if you increase the, the sort of the, the corruption, you see that the LD, that they uh, degrade much faster than, for instance, um, our joint model. And you can also see that the factor graph model here, again, it's much worse than LDPC in the beginning um, when... Uh, you don't have a lot of noise. Of course, these LDPC codes are very good at that point. But then we have add a lot of noise. Then it, you know, the, the model isn't correct anymore, and um, and 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 the GNN uh, does a bit better. But the, if you do things jointly, then it's it's even much better. Okay, so we've also applied this to fast MRI. Um, so that's not a graph, but that's an image. Um, but you can come up with your own sort of the same philosophy. But then for image reconstruction, also iterative image reconstruction, we did this with Patrick Putsky. Um, we submitted this to this fast MRI challenge that was organized by Facebook and NYU, um, and we actually won in the single coil track. Um, and so uh, there, you know, we had some extra innovations, like we had to make this thing invertible in order to solve some memory issues and stuff like that. But the, but the, uh, the philosophy of this idea worked out really well also in this real world problem. Okay, to conclude then, um, so, um, so, at the very highest level, machine learning is nothing else as uh, combining inductive biases plus data to make predictions. And, um, and of course, the name of the game is how to inject the right inductive bias um, and the right amount of inductive bias uh, for every problem. Um, so we can, we can look at symmetry um, and uh, sort of convolutions or an implementation of translational symmetry or an implementation of the inductive bias that the world is translational symmetric. And we've looked at graph convolutions, which, which handle typically permutation equivariance. Um, but uh, if we do this on a mesh, then um, that that group was too large, and we and and, and uh, we, we identified basically the proper symmetry in on a mesh, and then in, implemented that as mesh convolutions. And then the other one was uh, neural augmentation, which is hybrid message pass, hybrid classical belief propagation message passing, plus some GNN to correct for the errors. We, we can apply it, and we have applied it to error correction, decoding, nonlinear Kalman filters, fast MRI reconstruction, and radio astronomy. Um, and there's also this really cool application that we were involved in, but was basically done by astronomers um, on black hole lensing. So um, if you take an image of the sky of a galaxy where in front of the galaxy somewhere there is a black hole, then you see these really strange warped images. And then the task is to reconstruct the original source, which is behind the black hole. 
uh, and you know we all, all applied this particular technique uh, and then we got sales yard results there and there also an interesting application of this could be to COVID-19 contact tracing where you have a graph which evolves over time um, and you also need to do inference in that graph to figure out um, who you predict uh, is infected or infectious um, so it's also an inference algorithm on a graph and perhaps you know these ideas could be meaningfully uh, sort of applied to that case as well and uh, that's the end if there's any questions i'm happy to answer them well so maybe i can uh, take over uh thank you very much for the talk very very impressive um so for anyone who joined late um if you're following the the live stream you can enter the chat and ask questions there um i will go through them now and um relate them to max uh, best as i can so yes many people say uh, thanks for the very nice talk of course <laughs> applause applause um one question from the beginning um relates to causality um and asked to which extent you're, you're also looking at causal inference uh, so i'm guessing because um yeah, basically causal structures can be represented as graphs as well um can you comment on that uh yes yeah, so um we are actually in a different project um also looking actually explicitly at causal inference so um so that's unpublished work um but what we do there is we have an encoder let's say you have a whole bunch of um sort of objects which relate to each other in some way maybe particles which move through space um and you're gonna you want to figure out who influences who um in this graph so you so you, you say basically that the balls they um you know they they evolve under some kind of interaction where one could either Im influence the other or the other could influence the first or they could influence each other or none of them or they could not influence each other it's four choices and you have an, an and you want to predict first of all what is the actual um so what is the actual interaction structure and then given the interaction structure you know try to predict the future right um and so there it's we act, so so i would say that um therefore the causal problem is to figure out precisely you know what's the structure of the graph right who is in you know who is influencing who in this graph in what direction and and whether there is an interaction in the first place at all so that to me is the causal question that you can ask here and then you can send the messages in the direction of the causal direction um but in this work, we haven't looked at that, but that's certainly something that we will try to write up for, for NeurIPS. So that's basically a, a problem where the, um, the, the nodes in the graph are fixed, uh, are fixed but the, the edges uh, need to be found when you talk about causal inference, if I understand yeah, correctly. Right. Yeah, um, so I think that's correct, yes. It's like you, you One, try to figure out uh, the interactions and the direction of the interactions on the graph. Yeah. Um, how do you generally work with uh, changing topologies? So that question uh, came up in, in the context um, of meshes. Is that something you can do? So you mostly talked about uh, equivariance. Can you also work with uh, changing topologies? Like um, maybe splitting up polygons if you well yeah so the so the, the, there's the topology of the underlying manifold that we're trying to um, approximate with the mesh and i think we can handle different topologies there it could be a sphere it could be a donut or it could be a you know any other genus uh, sort of uh, surface i don't think that's an issue although the particular group under which we need to be um equivariant might change in uh, for particular cases um the topology of the mesh um so we used uh basically a mesh where you know every edge has two faces on either side of it 
um, and for that it works nicely. If you if you're gonna mess a lot with that, then you know you have to make sure that the mesh at least represents an approximation of a manifold. But you can make meshes which are not representative of a ma underlying manifold. And I, I guess that's really something that you have to respect. Otherwise, uh, you know, I think that's not a big issue. You can you can use very different meshes um, to do these uh, computations, and they're not very you know clearly one mesh could do better than another mesh. Um, but you could, for instance, learn the mesh. We haven't even tried that, but that's come up. You could say maybe in certain regions of space, you know, we don't need a very detailed mesh. In another region of space, we need a very detailed mesh, so we can move by learning the points of the mesh around to further improve the performance. Um, one question that was, I think, also asked uh, in the context <laughs> of meshes. Um, says, could we use <coughs> node ordering or different messages per node if the graph is weighted? Um, let's see if I understand that. Um, different messages per edge or different messages? Was that the question? Node ordering? No, so It just uh, says... Well, there is a node ordering in the sense that um, on a mesh, uh, you can go in a circle. Right, and there's an angle that you can define, and you can just order the nodes by the angle um, at which you, um, you know, at which you uh, sort of go through them. So let me maybe go back to that. Uh, or maybe I should. Um, here, right. So for this particular one, um, you can clearly see that you know you can define angles, and if you go in the order of those angles, then that's an ordering. Um, the only issue is that um, you have, you you can, you don't know where the angle theta equals zero is necessarily, right? So there is no uniquely defined um, sort of absolute frame in which you can say, okay, this is horizontal, or, you know, because, uh, you know, if you, if you go around and you come back, then this, this thing has changed. Um, and for certain, you know, topologies like spheres, you cannot get, you cannot get rid of it typically. So you have to, so that's the, so the ordering is there, but who is at the, at the angle theta equals zero isn't clear. And so you have to define this equivariance or this transformation property for, you know, that particular uh, sort of symmetry that you have in your network, the symmetry that you know the 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 the, the sort of the, the the absolute value of your your angles is not you cannot know doesn't exist. I hope that answered it. Yeah. All right. Also, if I'm relating the questions wrong, um, do feel free to correct me in the chat. Um, another question. Let me go through them. Uh, one question. I think I'm going to just read them directly. Uh, for the mesh neural networks, distance between nodes is typically meaningful, both between center node and each neighbor, uh, as yeah. well as between adjacent neighbors. Have you looked into equivariant convolutions incorporating distances? Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, so in this particular work, we wanted to be as simple as possible. So we wanted to keep things, you know, one of the goals was to keep things as close as possible to a GNN, right? So the GNN is below here. Um, let's see these pointer. So the GNN is below here. Um, and we wanted to make it look like a GNN as much as possible, but it's entirely true. And so basically what we just focused on is the angle theta, but you can see there is there is a little bit of a distance uh, sort of dependency in the sense that we have, you know, the self interaction, which is at the center at, at distance zero, and then everything else, which is a very, you know, very, very rough, clearly function of distance. But you can, you can be much more sophisticated. So you can make this kernel depend actually on the distance R as well. Um, so you could, for instance, have different layers, different sort of bands in which you, you define a different kernel K. Um, or you could even make this thing a function, like a, some, some kind of function of, of R um, that modulates that. So, um, so yes, this is a fairly straightforward generalization of what we did here. 
Um, however, we chose not to do it. First of all, we tried a few things, but it didn't really improve um, the performance. And we, and, we, and we really wanted to be as simple as possible and as close as possible to the graph neural net so that we sort of stuck with this formulation and, hope, and, and so with the hope that if we kept things simple that people would actually start to use it. All right. Um, another person asks if you generalize your work um, on meshes to higher dimensional manifolds. Uh, yeah, that's also a good question. Um, Again, it's fairly straightforward to do it. Uh, you have to the, the group uh, which was SO2, uh, which we had to be equivariant to, will then have is going to be a different group. Um, but um, yeah, it's a lot of work, right? So you know, if you do it, then you have to really think about how to mesh things in higher dimensions, and you know, and and these groups get more complicated and all this. So we picked the application. Where um, you know where most of the application we, we pick the dimension where most of the applications are, especially in the medical domain. I'm hoping that you know many of the problems are actually surfaces in 2D. I mean, it's very hard to to even imagine like a curved space in 3D, right? I mean, it's it's not so easy to you know to visualize what that means. Um, and so I think we sort of capture 90% of all the interesting cases with this particular one. Um, and but anyway, mathematically it's certainly very doable to also go to higher dimensions. Cool. Um, so regarding part two, um, someone asked, did I understand correctly that you only model the noise generation, not the latent distribution, and that this means that you therefore need ground truth data to train a model? How can you get such ground truth data for example, in uh, MRI? Yeah, OK, that's an excellent question. Um, yeah, so for MRI, uh, it's actually it's, it's actually uh, interesting. So what you do there is, so, so, so notice that this problem is uh, the problem of uh, fast MRI. So basically, the problem is to take a small subset of your measurements and then try to reconstruct the image from that small subset. So in a normal MRI, data set, you have many more Fourier components that are being measured. But this, the time you spend in an MRI machine is directly proportional to how many of those Fourier measurements you're making. So the idea is that you use ground truth as basically the high resolution image you reconstruct if you use all the Fourier components and do you use the best algorithm out there that uses all these Fourier components. And then, and then basically what we say is, well, let's say if we take, you know, one sixth or one eighth of these components, um, what can we still get close to, you know, the the one that we reconstructed with all of the Fourier components? So that's how you can get uh, ground truth there. You know, similarly for uh, for error correction decoding, right? Uh, in error correction decoding, uh, maybe this is a good example here. You can generate. A lot of data, actually infinite amount of data, by you know taking bits, sending them through a noisy channel, and then measuring the noisy bits, but just storing whatever you send, right? And in, in communication theory, that's basically what you what you do when you send a pilot wave. A pilot wave is exactly you know everybody knows what's being sent, and you observe what you get, and that gives you information about the channel, right? And there you know, and then using that particular channel, you then you know try to do the decoding. So again, here to train up these neural networks or these sort of enhancements of these neural networks, you can just use that particular uh, data um, that uh, you know that you generate by these pilot waves, for instance. All right. Um, another question, if you still have time. Um, yeah. wh what is missing <clears throat> if you apply an isotropic graph uh, convolutional network on a mesh? Do you mean yeah, isotropic so, uh, graph convolutional yeah. network are not powerful and efficient mm -hmm. enough in general? Yeah, so it, so maybe it's it's easiest to answer the question if I would sort of reflect it back and say, if I would tell you for image analysis, the only filter you could use is one that is isotropic. So that's a filter that is basically the same in all directions. It's like just has radial dependence. Uh, 
right? Then um, you couldn't do, you know, you would lose out on a lot of really important features like uh, Gabor uh, filters and all these kinds of things you could not represent. So there's a, it's like the set of filters that is isotropic is just very much smaller than the set of filters, which is, you know, general, which can represent, um, you know, direction. Um, and so we have this equivariance constraint, which means that it's, you know, there is some constraint. It's, it's not as flexible as a CNN because in a CNN, you know, an absolute directions mean something. So we have to have that constraint, but still the degrees of freedom are a lot more than the one you would have for a GNN, which is isotropic. And so you can compare this with a, a group convolutional neural net under rotations versus a normal neural net. Um, so clearly it's a bit, you know, you put some constraints on this because you want things to transform correctly. Um, but if the data actually has this particular property, then it can actually be useful. Um, but in general, it's, um, it's much more flexible than if you would use isotropic filters. All right. Um, someone asks, what are some ways to order nodes in a graph convolution, which you tried before settling on a single K for all neighbors? Um, in which to order? For a graph neural net or for a mesh neural net? For, yeah, for a graph neural net, it basically doesn't matter because you send the same message. So everything is explicitly order independent. Is basically the neighbors are treated as a set. Um, so whatever order you feed them, it doesn't matter. It doesn't change the outcome. Uh, for a mesh neural net, um, you just have to pick one node as your reference node. Um, and then, uh, you know, basically demand equivariance, and then you're good. And again, the answer will not depend on which node you picked. Maybe they meant if you uh, don't... Uh treat them all the same in a regular graph neural network. Okay, but then you're somewhat sure. into trouble, right? Because how are you then do sharing? So if I think of a graph neural net, I mean, if I have graphs which are always the same and you have many instances in your data set, you can certainly do that. But if you would have, let's say, you know, a very large graph, one single graph on which you would want to learn, or you would have many graphs, but they are very different shape and form, how are you going to share you know, your filters. It's not clear if you say, well, you know, every neighbor can send a different message because for the next point, there's a different number of neighbors and they're in a different order. So what does that mean, right? I mean, I have to pick some ordering then, and now the result is going to depend on this very arbitrary choice of ordering that I picked. And so I'm, I'm, I can get arbitrarily bad results by you know, picking a bad ordering there. So, yeah, so I think it's, uh, yeah, so it's, it's not really well defined, or it's not so clear what you would do in order to share your filter. Right, makes sense. Um, maybe I can ask a question uh, that's related to the fast MRI challenge. Um, do you remember how the, the case space was subsampled? Yeah, so that's not really my uh, cup of tea, but um, I do know that, um, let's see if I can find it here. Uh, so where is the case space? Okay, I didn't quite show it here. But the, it's, uh, the, sub, the subsampling happened basically by having a larger number of Fourier components in the middle, um, and, then, uh, and then subsampling more and more for the higher frequency ones. Now, clearly, this is something that was in the challenge, right? So the challenge is that these were actually physicians that knew precisely what they were doing. And so they had some protocol of, of that subsampling that we basically used. Uh, and you can probably just look it up at the Fast MRI uh, sort of website. Right, right. Because it, it looks a bit random. Um, so the question I wanted to ask is if you've uh, thought about combining your method maybe with uh some more advanced MRI technique like like fingerprinting. If you're um, familiar with that. Yeah, I don't know about fingerprinting, but um, but this is the state of the art, though, right? I mean, this this is basically the best. We won this challenge in the single coil, and in fact, we also worked with Philips, um, who had their own neural net 
which was different from ours, but also based on somewhat similar principles where they also used uh, these data terms, these data consistency terms, as they call them. Um, and it's also based on a deep neural net. So I think really the deep neural nets right now are the state of the art in this image reconstruction, at least for um, this uh, sort of uh, low Fourier sort of sampling uh, case. I don't know. You know, there's, of course, also things like compressed sensing, um, which are very good. But still, these deep learning methods beat the compressed sensing uh, methods, hands down, I think. So about fingerprinting, I don't know. Uh, so I cannot really say anything meaningful about that. Right, right. No, that will be a, a different acquisition method. So that was more um, targeted towards actual uh, application later. OK, so what is interesting, and, and we are working on that, is to do active acquisition. So can you come up with ways to, um, to a policy, basically, to sequentially capture the right Fourier components um, and do it in a way that is better than if you would predetermine this from the beginning, and even better, do it in a way that works together with the particular reconstruction method that you have chosen. So there's two components, the reconstruction method and then the active acquisition method. And one is, it becomes kind of like a re reinforcement learning problem where you know your task is to, you know after a small number of acquisitions, to get the best possible reconstructions back. Um, and you can do that by by improving your your reconstruction method, but you can also improve it by your acquisition method, basically. And and this is now this is I think uh, a very interesting that problem that also exists in astronomy because some of these telescopes, uh, these antennas can be moved around, so you can change your acquisition um, as well. So th this is a very interesting topic. Wow! Yeah, that sounds uh, very cool. Um, I think that's it with the questions from the chat. Um, obviously, maybe if, if Lena has more questions or wants to say some final words, uh, I think now would uh, be the right moment. If not, maybe her microphone doesn't work. Um, I'm just going to say uh, thank you very much for the great talk. I really enjoyed it. I think uh, all the people did. Um, many uh, said uh, very nice talk. Thank you very much uh, in the chat. So obviously yeah. that goes to you. Max, you for... many thanks also from my side. It was great to have you. Uh, and yeah, your your uh, will be put online. We will send you a link. OK, thank you very much for inviting me. It was a pleasure. OK. Bye-bye. Thank you, Max. <laughs> Bye.